All right, uh, I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit and show uh, a case of uh, an IOL exchange. Uh, so this is a, a patient who's actually four years out uh, following Restore. She has a trabeculectomy and uh, like many of these patients has had a YAG capsulotomy. And uh, so here's the TRAB. Uh, this is after dilation so you guys can see there's synechiae to this small rexus and there's a YAG capsulotomy. So um, we won't go into all the reasons, but we decided that uh, this lens needed to come out. There are a lot of higher aberrations on the, uh, on the Tracy. So the first thing I have to do is break the synechiae here. And of course the question is, you know, can we avoid vitreous loss and how are we going to get the, the, the lens out of this uh, <coughs> small rexus? Uh, what, are, what are sort of the challenges that you guys would uh, foresee in a case like this besides the capsule being open? I think one, one hard thing is just getting between the lens and the capsule. And uh, I, I think sometimes if you use a, um, a needle, like a 26 gauge needle, uh, and turn, the, turn it so that the, the bevel is down, you can, get, you can get between there and start, and, and on that needle have attached some viscoelastic. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. So that, that is actually, you know, absolutely great because it, you get this tightly bound uh, sphincter-like effect of the rexus to the uh, IOL and you really have to go around in several directions to break that. And I'm literally tenting it up just so I can get my viscoat uh, cannula underneath. Alan, what viscoelastic do you like for uh, an IOL exchange? Uh, I, I like to use a, a dispersive and uh, for me it's, uh, uh, it just diffuses out, stays there. I like the separation that I get from dispersants. Yeah. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I use this code as well. Yeah, so that's a three for three. Uh, you know, I think it, uh, one of the things I'm doing here is I'm coming in all three directions from, and I'll use the side port, you, you may have to burp the chamber from time to time so you don't overfill. And what, what will have happened to the uh, posterior capsule by now, it's pretty much going to be blown out and you expect that because there's no uh, circular edge. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to now mobilize it and uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, this, this haptic right here is pretty much uh, stuck. And uh, typically what will happen is, you know, certainly after a year or so, that little bulb tip on the end just uh, seems to get fibrosed in and there's a little tunnel here. So um, Alan, what should what? I do? What you can you can do a couple of things. One, of course, is is you can take your viscoelastic, start at start at the end, and go go di directly out and and try to to free it up. And then sometimes you can then use one of the MST forceps to hold it and and pull not centrally but peripherally to to, to break it. Um, but the other thing you can do is just uh, cut it mm -hmm. okay. and just leave it. So uh, this thing is really fibrosed in here. I think the fact that my cap posterior capsule is open just tells me I don't really want to forcibly distend the equator. So I'm kind of coming in with a bevel. I'm cutting with the bevel so that you, you have a somewhat of a beveled edge. And uh, so these are the, uh, the MST cutters. Um, and the, this is actually a 1.2 millimeter incision. So you have the option of coming in through a separate port uh, from your uh, IOL incision. And so I'm actually cutting this inside the bag. And you can see the advantage of the design is that to saw, as you open and close the blades, you're not, in this case, uh, doing anything to distort the incision. Or if it was the incision here, you're not uh, letting uh, viscoelastic burp out. And, uh, y you know, the blades are short enough, so I'm just very carefully trying to uh, cut, transect the optic while it's still in the bag. Uh, so I'm able to pull out one half uh, and the other half is mobilized and so again plenty of viscoelastic because the posterior capsule is gone at this point and I'm just trying to obviously maintain the, the intact capsularexis because that's pretty much all I'm going to have for the IOL support. Uh, so here I'm using this uh, micro grasper and again it's a large enough piece that uh, I have to pull it over and that's the last haptic that uh, I transected to free it up. So both um, tips of the haptic were fibrosed in, they're both left behind, but now I've mobilized uh, this piece. You, uh, this is uh, soft enough acrylic, you could probably pull it through, 
but uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut this one more time. So this is the typical configuration. You come in through a side port, you have uh, bimanual fixation, and then again you see how the sawing action of the scissors does not uh, empty the chamber by burping it. And again, um, even though it would mold, I'm trying to put as little force on the eye as possible on the incision knowing that the capsule uh, is open. Uh, so these forceps are also nice for reaching inside the eye and, and retracting the pieces. And uh, would you use um, Kenalog here? I'm actually just sweeping and I think uh, I'm trusting that, uh, believe it or not, there's no vitreous. And I think that's the other advantage of viscoat is it really stays where you put it. It, it uh, uh, doesn't aspirate out as easily. And then my uh, lens for the sulcus uh, is typically going to be the star AQ2010 because it's the only one that's 13.5 millimeters long, uh, haptic to haptic. Uh, and this is again a case where with that small of a rexus and it's fibrotic, I, I chose not to capture it. Right. Uh, and then uh, prior to doing the uh, INA, I put in some myocol so that the iris overlaps the edge of the optic. Uh, and so this patient has uh, basically the haptics of the restore but uh, a three-piece lens in the sulcus. Comments? All right, I, I, we have time for one more case, and I think, um, so this is a, a reminder, this is uh, in your packet, uh, but uh, I was invited by the Academy to create uh, the first, what they're calling a master class. And it's basically an online video course, uh, and uh, I, I chose the topic weak zonules, and actually have 32 videos now uh, online on the ONE site, and it's a course. So the, I've broken it into chapters and sort of gone through all the different steps and, and devices and so forth uh, that I could think of uh, uh, in terms of how I manage uh, weak zonules, and it's sort of pseudoexfoliation and trauma uh, are the two big sections. So that's just been uh, posted there. So this is uh, a case of a traumatic uh, zonular, uh, traumatic madriasis, again, and, and a cataract. So the capsulorexis is your capsule stress test. And so the first thing we see here is that the, the bag is very mobile. And so I tend to err a little bit on the small side because uh, th these are cases where you're more at risk for losing the tear uh, peripherally. And then these are uh, the MST nylon capsule retractors. And they come three to a set because usually you don't need more than uh, three. And often you'll need one or two. And they go in through uh, clear corneal stab incisions, and they're double-barreled 5.0 nylon so that you, you end up with this loop on the end, which I think is more uh, capsular bag friendly and less likely to perforate through. Um, the, the one pearl I have on this is, you know, I will put these in before rotating the nucleus because uh, they're going to pin the bag to the eye and give you more uh, rotational stability of the bag. So here I go in with the hydrodissection. Uh, and this is the uh, area where there's uh, a little bit of tilt, and you can see that this uh, holds things for me. And then I'll put in my third one because I, I just want to um, stabilize the back further. Now, the the number one uh, mistake that you know I learned the hard way is you you tend to make these a little too tight because you're thinking you know pupil retractors, and I need to put some tension on it. And so when I go, the time to look is when you go in with the FACO tip because you don't know how far back sometimes that lens will fall backward. And I'm going to watch where the, uh, the uh, capsule retractor is. And if I see it tent up too much, uh, then I'm going to stop. So I go in and I can see that I'm tenting now the capsule orexis too much. Again, it's the hydrostatic force of the irrigation pushing the lens back suddenly tensing up the anterior capsule. So I've loosened that, and now when I go in, I just take a moment and I check, and I make sure I'm not overly peaking my capsule orexis before proceeding. Uh, and so uh, this is absolutely just uh, essential, I think, for these weak zonial cases, because you're getting rotational stability, you're getting support in the AP direction, and that's very important when you're doing the FACO. And then finally, it's sort of keeping the bag from wanting to collapse in toward the FACO tip, where in essence you, you end up uh, aspirating the entire peripheral capsular bag. Uh, and so uh, this essentially serves as artificial zonules and allows you to delay putting the CTR in until as late as possible, because as you know, uh, putting the CTR in will tend to uh, trap um, the, uh, the cortex and the epinucleus. 
Uh, the other key, I think, is to repeatedly use, in this case, Visco, to uh, el you know, expand the bag, uh, either when you're on your last piece of nucleus or the epinucleus or a cortex, because even with the uh, retractors, you're not tensing up the posterior capsule. And you have to think that, gee, I don't have the normal zonular tension, so my posterior capsule's more pliant, and it's going to want to get aspirated more easily. So one advantage of bimanual INA, besides getting access to the subincisional cortex. So here again, I'm putting in that visco, because instead of having zonular tension, I'm using the visco to tense up and push back my posterior capsule. Um, and so it, it helps to pause there. The other nice thing about bimanual INA is you can spend more of the por this uh, uh, maneuver with the aspirating port facing the cornea and not facing back toward the equator or the posterior capsule, which is, again, uh, more compliant. And then uh, I'm going to put in the, uh, the capsule tension ring. Now, here I see there actually is a tiny little tear. And I think this is probably where the double barrel helped me from having this go out too far. Because uh, again, uh, it, this is the one thing that will happen. If they're too tight, you'll split the capsule. So because it was just a slightly little bit of a rounded one. And then before I put the CTR in, I looked very carefully for any stria in the posterior capsule. Because that's what will get caught by the leading eyelid of the CTR. So time again to add more viscoelastic. Aim that injector tip way off to the side so that th that allows the ring to open to my right with a minimum of displacement. And you can see that this is why we leave the uh, capsule retractors in place uh, for the CTR because, again, it's going to stabilize uh, the bag. You can pull these out just like iris retractors. I, I just uh, wanted to demonstrate another technique, which uh, because they're so large, if, if you were having trouble, you can just slide off the eyelet. But uh, you can also just back them out like you would with uh, iris retractors. Um, the, you can't see it from this view, but the bag is tilted here off to the side. So uh, like the previous two speakers, I'm going to put in an Ahmed segment. Uh, and these are just a lot easier to put in than a, a, the, the original Sioni ring. And uh, we're all doing it a little different. This is 9 proline. I've threaded it outside the eye. I'm going to bring it ab interno and exit over here. And so it's just going to be easier if I drive the needle from uh, this side of the eye. So through a clear corneal incision here, this is a guide needle just to allow me to bring my two double-armed straight needles over to this side. Then I go a guide needle through a half-thickness scleral groove. It's a 25-gauge needle. And that guides the exit of my proline needle above the anterior capsule, under the iris, and at the base of that half-thickness scleral groove. So again, I have my other 10-O uh, arm here. This guide needle goes maybe a millimeter over. It's under the iris, over the anterior capsule. The second of the double arm needle goes through. So now we have both needles exiting at the base of the groove so that when I tie the knot, it will drop down uh, right into this uh, half thickness scleral groove. So here you have to adjust the tension. You want enough that it's going to support the bag, but not so much, again, that it's going to uh, over distend that. And then uh, we'll cut that here. Uh, and uh, uh, again, the, this is the one foldable three-piece lens that's uh, longer than 13. Uh, it's an awkward injector, uh, but the, the haptics are uh, elastomide. They're very, very flexible. You can see how large this eye is. And then you have the option of capturing it uh, with the Rexus. But I like placing the IOL in the sulcus when the zonules are really weak. Uh, because then the haptics are actually providing another way to transmit force uh, to the ciliary body instead of via the zonules. And then uh, just as Tom showed, I, I also like placing these two interrupted sutures. Uh, I use the MST forceps to take a very aggressive bite on each side. Uh, and then this is a, a teno proline, which I think is fine for iris sutures. And then I come out here through the incision for my seeps or uh, slip knot as well. Uh, so this video is narrated. It's on the, uh, the Academy website uh, uh, for that course, and, and uh, this will bring it through. So I usually go from about here to here. You have to take really pretty large bites. Um, and the nice thing about uh, the traumatic pupil is you're not really missing tissue. You're just missing uh, the sphincter. 
but sometimes you're gonna have a, a fairly sizable gap here, but if it's superior and it's under the lid, uh, less of a problem here. But you can see the beauty of these forceps coming through a paracentesis, uh, and just like a, uh, <clears throat> you can drape the iris right over there. This is exiting the needle. You can just force it through the uh, cornea, or here I have a little stab incision, so I use a visco cannula to let me uh, exit it, and we'll pull that through and, and cinch it down. And, and it, it really is neat how with just the two interrupted, it's so much easier than trying to snake the needle around and to do a, uh, a cerclage there. Great. So uh, that's going to uh, wrap it up. I see it's uh, just past 8.30, so I want to thank, uh, again, my two uh, collaborators up here in the podium, Alan Crandall, Tom Oding, and thanks to uh, iWorld and MST, and also our audience for joining us this morning. All right, have a good day. Thank you.